first a week. So okay. Okay. everybody. <laughs> yeah, sort of going off of that, I have a small theater company. We have a campaign on Indiegogo right now. We're sponsored through Fractured Atlas. Um, and we're really gearing our campaign towards the first production of our season. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, we want it. I mean, we have other productions planned after that. We have residencies and we obviously want to build sustainability. So I was wondering what any of you can say for using this like very time constricted fundraising tool to then build a sustainable mm -hmm. donor base and sustainable fans and I mean, planning. Yeah, in, in terms of um, repeatability in, uh, on one of our platforms, I, the, the biggest thing, in my opinion, in order to keep it fresh and keep people coming back, is how interesting the rewards are. Um, in terms of turning those contributors into uh, more annualized repeat. Uh, donors, um, I would suggest then uh, an offline event um, in the sense that you want to connect with these people separately in order to have a real vested interest in uh, everything that you do, not just the events that you post online, um, then you need to engage them uh, offline as well. I mean, lots of our uh, users who have opportunities to do uh, offline events are very successful at them. Everything from uh, you know a solo guitarist playing a gig and then you know saying at that gig, hey, I'm raising money on Rocket Hub for my next album, whatever it is, um, and then I'm applying all of my tips tonight to my CD. So hey, please tip me. Um, they're not looking to then build a longer-term relationship. Uh, with these, you know, folks who are in the audience that given night at the bar, but um, that's a viable live event. Uh, and if you had an offline invite only, only for our, uh, you know, our Indiegogo contributors, uh, and thank them and you know really engage them uh, offline as well, that could be the intro to a, a different kind of conversation, but. Um, if you're just focused on raising the money online for uh, individual productions, then it's got to be in the rewards. I mean, you, can't, fresh. you can't forget these are relationships. Yeah. I mean, this isn't just people with checkbooks. They're not like their mm -hmm. head has not been replaced by dollar sign. I mean, these are people and they have <laughs> needs and they're needs that actually you want to meet. You know, really honestly. Like, so, and this is true from whether you're doing a, you know, a Kickstarter campaign to whether you're romancing the Ford Foundation, it's a romance, people. I mean, you don't, you know, they don't want to go to a shitty cheap date. Nobody wants to do that. They want to go to a sexy date. So they got to give them a sexy date. One other thing I um, is to think about your fundraising with, right, when are the people most likely to give? It's right after they've gone to your performance and they're like, that was the most amazing thing I ever saw. So do you ask them before they forget? So you know, some theater companies have to get the money up front for all the entire season, and others do one production and then they start raising money for the next one. <laughs> so a lot of small ones, that's the case because you just don't have the capacity. But can you be ready with maybe two Indiegogo campaigns, one that's the week after your run, only for people who came, that has just a one-week limit to raise this first tranche of money, and then you're going to launch a broader campaign. So maybe you have different rewards. If you came the first time, it's a lower gift and you get the VIP ticket. We're going to make this available to the rest of the community next week, but because you came this time, you get the first dibs. And the way you set that up is actually it's two campaigns, because you can't kind of stagger in the campaign, but you can absolutely do one week and then three months. And it's a nice way to kind of get the people who are repeating to feel like they're getting preferential treatment, they get the VIP where you serve them box one. the number of people who are like Jason who are like, you know, you know, I, I think Rocket Hub is awesome and so I'm just gonna troll around for interesting stuff and get into things that I, where I don't even know 
any of the people involved, but I think it's too much. Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, I don't have any hard uh, figures to quote for you. Um, my gut feeling is that the vast majority of the contributions are effectively solicited from friends, family, fans, and sort of uh, more uh, distant portions of, of that continually growing network. Um, certainly there are plenty of folks who are active on the site who display similar behavior. Um, and, you know, we, we find that a lot of the folks who actually post projects end up contributing small dollar amounts, but contributing to other folks on the site. It's a nice community. It's a supportive community. Um, and uh, certainly we've gotten very large contributions from folks who are total strangers to the individual creative. Um, I think our largest was uh, Darko, who, uh, who had a film at Tribeca last year, not this year, um, won the Choice of New York Award or something along those lines. Um, he was raising money to do a U.S. release of his film, and uh, he got a $5,000 contribution from a total stranger. Um, somebody who really liked the reward, which was um, Darko is a Serbian national, um, and the film was filmed half in New York and half in uh, Belgrade. And the reward was fly over to, to Belgrade, and I will give you a tour of the city and uh, all of the different locations that we shot in, and you know, we'll travel around together for uh, a week. Um, and, you know, while it may be terrifying to offer that to the internet at large, Darko was comfortable with it, and um, he's, uh, he managed to get a, a very large contribution from somebody who really doesn't know. So the behavior exists, but I wouldn't necessarily count on the internet angels of the world. Um, you know, you, you have to shoot for an attainable goal that you can raise within your own network, and then as it grows beyond that, things start to happen, certainly. And I know that, uh, I know somebody that uh, got saddled with a producer. Yeah. But, but that happens actually in real life, too. Sure. Like, where, you know, he has an associate producer who bought the credit, but then now it's on IMDb and this guy travels to film festivals as part of a team <laughs> and has no experience and right. has bought his title, but is, you know, using, basically, effectively, leveraging the other producer's relationships and renown, I think it's part of the team. So, again, be careful. Uh, in back. Yeah, a related issue, and I'm not starting an artistic endeavor, but I have legal pro bono clients who are the client here. And if you're giving parts of your work as an incentive for donations, it'd be very careful about the rights that follow from that. Mm -hmm. You know, I would encourage everyone to consult volunteer lawyers with regards to draft agreements, making clear the donors exactly what they're getting. Right, and um, how they can use those, yeah. yeah. I have a question for our users. Do you want a break for networking at 8.49? Yeah, we have to break into the line. So okay. Okay. So um, on that note, uh, I'm going to free you all to drink as much wine as you can. <laughs> 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 um, enjoy. Everyone's quite available for any questions. Have a great night. Thank you.